course, it's my great pleasure to uh, welcome Clinton Fernandez back to the bookshop. Clinton's been a long time supporter of the bookshop. He's given a number of talks over the years. Um, uh, and so we're really happy to have him back. Um, he's very well credentialed to talk to us about Australian foreign policy. Uh, he's a professor at the uh, UNSW uh, and has published many books on uh, Australian foreign policy. Uh, most recently, we have it at the back, uh, Islands Off the Coast of Asia. Just speaking personally, I'm pretty uh, stoked to have Clinton because I think he's a really important and quite unique voice within the scholarly debate around Australian foreign policy. Not that I follow it closely, but that's my perception. Um, unlike many scholars in the fields, uh, Clinton exposes the way in which Australian foreign policy uh, is in many ways shaped by narrow economic interests, particularly corporate interests, rather than any genuine notion of the common good. Uh, he shows, uh, particularly in his new book, the many ways um, in which things like the national interest or national security um, are often uh, really just about serving uh, narrow ag agendas of economic players. Uh, and his latest book is, is really like a history of for Australian foreign policy uh, from, the, from that perspective, as well as with a huge amount of empirical evidence and data, uh, including from declassified records, so it's really well worth looking at. Um, of course, Clinton's focus tonight is really on Australia and East Timor and the ongoing legal case in, um, uh, surrounding that, uh, around two citizens and their revelations of Australian espionage, uh, espionage that the Australian government uh, has uh, been, as we know, uh, um, uh, has done against East Timor. So we're really looking forward to hearing what Clinton has to teach us about that and what it says about Australian foreign policy. So please give Clinton a welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Before uh, I start, I'll just, uh, since uh, he's just started with an ad, I'll start with an ad as well. I'm uh, really pleased to see that one of my favourite musicians of all time, the great David Hosking himself, is in the audience. Uh, look him up, get his CDs, uh, wonderful Australian voice. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, I listened to a lot of your music while I was doing this, uh, this book. Um, okay, so um, Hard to know where to start, really, uh, given that there are so many different uh, uh, aspects of this case uh, and the story in play. Uh, for those wanting the most comprehensive, detailed, uh, you know, the best case that I could make, um, it's in chapter seven of the book. Okay, so if you, you want all the evidence and everything else, just have a look at that. Um, let's just uh, start with uh, something that happens on the 9th of September, 2004. Okay, on the 9th of September 2004, uh, a car bomb goes off outside the Australian Embassy in Jakarta. Um, there are several people killed, including an Indonesian policeman, several people standing in line for their visas. Um, and that uh, car bomb uh, happens at uh, the same time as something else is going on elsewhere in the archipelago to our north. Uh, at the same time as the car bomb is going off, uh, an espionage operation is underway in East Timor. And uh, it's the contrast between uh, those two elements that I think uh, I'll frame this talk on. Um, the um, the uh, early 2000s was uh, part of the decade of terror. Uh, the invasion of Iraq uh, had uh, raised the terrorist threat. Uh, the Bali bombings of 12th of October 2002 um, uh, put Islamic terrorism um, on, the, on the agenda. Uh, in about July 2004, uh, there was a white paper on counterterrorism issued by the Howard government. Um, and in that white paper, uh, the words um, extremist Islamist terror uh, were mentioned more than 100 times, and Indonesia was said to be a focus more than 50 times in the space of that 100 page white paper. So it was very clear uh, that the government uh, was, at least in its, in its rhetoric, was identifying uh, the key focus of uh, policy and uh, intelligence um, and so on as extremist Islamist terror um, in the Indonesian archipelago. Uh, and yet, um, the focus of ASIS, uh, or the Australian Secret Intelligence Service, uh, was not uh, on extremist Islamic terror in the uh, Indonesian archipelago, but on a country that's about 95% Catholic with no known Islamic uh, terrorist groups, namely East Timor. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, uh, it, it, I think the, 
the instruments of statecraft are varied. Uh, there's diplomacy, which is what diplomats do. There's tradecraft. Uh, um, there's uh, tr you know, trade agreements. Um, there's monetary policy. There are things that are overt, but there are things that are covert, and they both try and achieve the same thing. Uh, and usually, what's happening below the surface, uh, below the waterline, uh, whether that's literally below the waterline, any submarine operations or intelligence operations, uh, are hidden from public view. And you sometimes find out about them 30 years later, sometimes you don't. But in this case, uh, we have a very clear picture that emerges uh, because there was grave uh, disquiet within the Australian Secret Intelligence Service at the diversion of uh, scarce resources away from the war on terror into the targeting of the Timorese High Command, uh, senior leadership uh, during oil and gas negotiations uh, between Australia and Indonesia, uh, and, and East Timor, sorry. Um, now, I will talk a little bit about the people who are facing trial, but I just want to put it in some perspective. Um, the uh, support for uh, oil companies is long running in Australian foreign policy, um, and it's taken uh, certain forms that most people are simply not aware of. Okay? I've traced that in the, in the book, in chapter seven. Uh, in uh, the 1950s, nobody knew what actually lay under the waterline. If you go to the coastline anywhere on our continent and you try and figure out what's there, it just looks like a sea, you don't really know what's underneath it. Um, and so um, the Bureau of Mineral Resources, uh, today called Geoscience Australia, conducted a comprehensive survey of the, the, uh, the prolongation uh, of the coastline under the water, that's called the continental shelf. Um, it uh, involved the following process. A ship would leave Port Melbourne, it would go off to a predetermined point um, on, onto, uh, into the water, turn left 20 nautical miles and come back. And it would do this 24 hours a day, seven days a week, for years, mapping the entire uh, continental shelf, the margin outside, uh, you know, around the coast. It trailed behind it a, a proton precession magnetometer that would work out uh, what's the iron content underneath the water. There was a, a, a device to measure uh, the gravitational field of the Earth under the waterline. Okay, the Earth is not solid, it's uh, got a solid crust, but it's got a molten core. Um, and it's, the mass is not distributed evenly. So if you can map the gravitational field, you can work out what's underneath the waterline, okay, because different objects have different gravitational um, forces. Um, there was a, uh, a winch, a coring and dredging winch, uh, with a 20-ton braking strength that was 10 kilometers long, and it would scrape the seabed. So it was 10 kilometers deep, it would scrape the seabed, collect sediments, and on a three decks of a ship, this is all happening 24 hours a day, three decks of a ship, there'd be real-time tests to work out what exactly is under the waterline. Okay. There was, um, uh, if it's, if it's oceanic crust, um, that tends to be basaltic, uh, which is a combination of uh, rocks that are rich in silica and magnesium. If it's coming in from the, from the uh, rivers, uh, dropping it onto the, uh, onto the ocean floor, um, that's uh, granitic, which means it's rich in silica and alumina. So all of that has to be worked out. Okay, and after more than a decade, all at public expense, uh, the um, Bureau of Mineral Resources, today called Geoscience Australia, uh, went from knowing nothing about what l Australia looked like under the waterline to having a very clear picture of uh, exactly uh, where the troughs were, where the, uh, uh, where the crevices were, the, the cre uh, crevices were uh, what it looks like if there's kelp uh, in, trapped in the rocks, that's a possible predictor of uh, liquefied natural gas crap there. Um, and so all of this was done at public expense. Now, it's not secret in the sense that it was announced in the budget. Okay? But you have to be kind of reading the Journal of the Bureau of Mineral Resources and all their findings to work out this is actually going on. Uh, so this begins in December uh, 1970. Um, and it's happening at the same time as Australia is negotiating uh, the Law of the Sea Convention. Uh, with all the other countries of the world, um, you know, between 73 and uh, 82. So it begins in December 1970, and they know the law of the sea convention is coming on. And so the geoscience is feeding into uh, the negotiators secretly. Okay. So, for example, the negotiators say, well, that country has proposed that uh, um, a ridgeline under the water 
should be defined in a particular way, because it's not exactly clear where something starts and when it ends. And so they would go and run tests, say, for example, in, Macqu in, in the Macquarie Ridge, which is near Macquarie Island, uh, that is uh, uh, in the Southwest Pacific, I think below New Zealand, and, and above Antarctica, so it's in the middle of that. Okay. And they said, well, if you, define, uh, if you define the continental shelf in the Law of the Sea Convention like this, then we lose half the ridge. But if you define it in some other way, then we gain all the ridge. Okay. And so they went through the entire, all, all the seven sub-Antarctic islands, all the geoscience data, and they ensured that Australia got the best possible uh, definition of the continental shelf, which is uh, explained in Article 76 of the Law of the Sea Convention. Uh, I won't go into the technicalities of that, it's in the book. And so then what happens? They say, well, um, we've got all this geoscientific information, we've got uh, a very broad continental shelf uh, in the northwest. Okay, it's quite shallow, and it just slopes gently for about 350 nautical miles off the coast of Broome, and Karatha, Karanara, all those other places. It just keeps going. Barrow Island. Uh, there's not much of a continental shelf on the east coast of Australia, okay, but there's a long continental shelf, a broad margin on the northwest shelf. Um, so they have all this information, all this geoscientific in uh, information, um, and other countries do too. You know, advanced uh, industrial countries like Norway, for example, which uh, is quite interested in its oil in the North Sea. Um, and has interest in something called the Svalbard, which is up in the, near the poles. Um, so the, Norway has its own oil company. Okay, it's called Statoil. We don't have our own oil company. So what the federal cabinet did, this is, now we're into the, uh, the period of the, of the labor government, okay, of the uh, mid-1980s. Uh, it takes all this geoscientific data and it hands it across to the oil companies. It doesn't charge them very much, less than 5% of what it cost. Okay. They take this data, and, and the survey has continued till 2002, because it takes a while. And I want to emphasize what I mean by that. Australia's uh, land area is 7.69 million square kilometers. That's how big we are. Okay. We've got more exclusive economic zone under the water than we have on land. We've got 12 million square kilometers uh, under the water. Okay. Most people would not realize that, in fact, Australia has more land under the water than we have land on land. Okay? And all of that has to be mapped. Okay? How big is 12 million square kilometers? Well, you know, Victoria is 220,000 square kilometers. Okay? So that's how big it is. Um, and so uh, Australia is 7.69 million square kilometers. So they map all that. Uh, the Northwest Shelf Project is formed around November 1984. Uh, it's an investment, a private investment of $27 billion, uh, inaugurated by former Premier Brian Burke of Western Australia. Uh, as a coalition of, uh, of companies led by Woodside Petroleum. What they do is they take all this geoscientific data, they go off to the Northwest Shelf knowing where the, the gas is, drill the hole, up comes the gas, and it results in the biggest single export contract ever signed by anybody for anything in Australian history. Okay, it's a $25 billion contract uh, to sell uh, gas to uh, Guangdong province of China. Uh, in 2002. Five years later, the same, the same uh, coalition uh, you know, consortium uh, has an even bigger contract, $45 billion, once again to China. And it's bottomless. Now it's $68 billion. There's more. It's just, if I had a, uh, if I had a, um, a, a light pro, I'd have shown you exactly where the oil fields are. Now all of that has been done uh, at public expense. So if we were to take, for example, the standard capitalist principle, that if you take the risk, you bear the cost, you should get the profit, um, then in fact uh, the profit should go to us. Um, but we don't have a capitalist system. Uh, we, have, we, we don't. Um, I, I just fail to see, I'm not even presenting what I'm saying as caricature or irony. Um, in fact, what we have is a system where the shareholders of Woodside and uh, the other uh, uh, members of the uh, consortium uh, benefit disproportionately. Uh, from the profits. So how much did we get? Uh, well, from November 84 to December 2017, uh, based on Northwest Shelf Project and Woodside's own data, um, the taxpayer received through taxes, excise, and royalties, all sources, $26 billion. Okay, so that's, the that's what we got. Uh, by contrast, uh, Norway got about $1.2 trillion. 
Uh, admittedly, they have perhaps more oil, but we have still got a lot more to get. Um, and Norway put its uh, oil money into its petroleum fund. It created a petroleum fund. Uh, the petroleum fund has uh, employees on the board of directors. Its decisions are made open to the public. Um, and um, uh, Norway has a population of about 6 million. Okay, so uh, uh, they've got 1.2, 1.3 trillion dollars in the petroleum fund. Uh, we've received about 26 billion dollars from all sources from that entire Northwest Shelf project. Uh, and um, none of this information was particularly secret. It just had to be pulled together to actually work out where it is. Um, now, this is the context in which I think we should see the government's support for a particular company, in this case Woodside, uh, in the dispute with East Timor, uh, with the espionage against Timor, uh, and the trial, the upcoming trial of Bernard Caleri and Witness K. It's not enough to just look at this particular trial, but to see it in the broader context of massive state, state subsidy for the private sector. Okay, so what exactly happens? Well, in uh, May 2002, Timor is supposed to become an independent state. Uh, the Indonesians have left, uh, or at least Australia arrives, on the 20th of September, 99. And this year, 20th September, is 20 years. Uh, those of you who are involved in any way with Timor should be prepared for an onslaught of, uh, of uh, backslapping uh, propaganda about how wonderful everything has been. Um, so 20th September, 99, uh, Australia arrives. Shortly thereafter, the Indonesian forces begin to leave, and they, in fact, do leave. Um, but May 2002, Timor is supposed to become independent. Now, three months beforehand, Timor receives uh, a legal opinion commissioned by a deceased friend of mine, uh, Andrew McNaughton, by three leading uh, international maritime law experts. And it shows that if international law were to apply, uh, then Timor would get uh, a maritime border halfway between Australia and us, Australia and East Timor, um, Australia and them. Um, and um, this legal opinion was circulating in Dili uh, at the time, uh, and so knowing about this, uh, it came to the I know it came to the attention of the uh, the Australian government through our embassy there, uh, and so in March 2002, three months before Timor was became independent uh, and therefore had an independent legal personality, um, uh, Alexander Downer, as foreign minister, withdrew from the jurisdiction of the uh, maritime section of the International Court of Justice. Okay, you're allowed to do that. If you're a state, you can say, well, I don't accept the treaty in respect of this. Um, and so the International Court of Justice, one of the uh, uh, organs of the, the Supreme Judicial Organ of the United Nations, um, if Timor had taken us to that, uh, to that court, the World Court as it's known, uh, it, um, it would have gotten a fair deal, would have gotten its, its rights under international law, but because it couldn't, uh, since we've withdrawn from the, the maritime board, uh, jurisdiction of the International Court of Justice, um, Timor uh, had no ability to enforce its rights. Um, and it also had no money uh, because, uh, you know, it doesn't really have any money. It, it, its money uh, comes from the oil. Um, and so um, uh, there was a, a lot of arm twisting to force Timor to sign these treaties. Um, and by April 2004, it became pretty clear to the foreign minister uh, that uh, there was not going to be uh, uh, a complete surrender by the Timorese. They were only going to, to agree to certain things because they really had no money, but they weren't prepared to sign away all their rights uh, once and for all, which is what they were required to do. Uh, there's a very important gas field uh, called Greater uh, called Sunrise and Troubadour. Together they're called Greater Sunrise, and so Timor wanted its hands, to get its hands on that, but Australia also wanted to get its hands on that. Uh, so April 2004, uh, talks finally stall, and it looks like uh, it's not going to happen. Uh, according to information that has since become public and uh, has been covered by Senator Rex Patrick in Parliament under parliamentary privilege, uh, which is why I'm able to speak about it freely, so long as I stick to uh, the script. Um, according to the information that's become public, um, uh, Alexander Downer is alleged to have ordered the, uh, the, the bugging of the T. Marie's uh, cabinet offices in order to uh, uh, work out exactly what they needed to offer them or what would work uh, for, to make them sign the treaty. Um, and uh, according to, now this is an educated guess, by around July 2004, the, uh, the bugs were in place. Um, uh, the Australian Secret Intelligence Service uh, was told, focus on Timor. This is, and bear in mind, by this time, the counterterrorism white paper uh, has been published. 
uh, extremist Islamist uh, terrorism in the Indonesian archipelago is a focus. Uh, but ACES has been told, no, what we want you to do is uh, go and spy on the Timorese. So they use the cover of an aid program, an Aussie aid program, to refurbish the uh, uh, cabinet offices. Um, and they go in and they bug uh, certain offices. And I'll explain which ones in a second. Um, now, there's a, th there's a certain sort of irony about this, because uh, there was great disquiet within ACES itself. Those guys simply couldn't work out why they were being told to go and do this, because it seemed pretty clear that there was a commercial element to it, um, and I guess they're not used to it, uh, not, not some of the, the older people who remember the Cold War and other kinds of things. Um, there are talks scheduled for September 2004 and October 2004, and uh, the normal pattern is that they meet in the negotiating rooms, both sides, and then in the breaks, they break away and the Australian side goes back to the embassy and the Timorese side, its negotiators, go to the cabinet offices and brief their cabinet on what's just happened. And they keep doing that. This goes on for a few days uh, up to a week in September and then some more in September and then after that in October again. Uh, and so um, uh, the rooms into which the Timorese team retires to brief uh, the rest of their cabinet are the ones that are bugged. Uh, and it, I just want to say that it's not simply like putting an iPhone in front of me or uh, the friendly guy working for ASIO there is just micing me up and, uh, and uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, videotaping. No, uh, you have to measure the geometry of a room. Okay, you've got to have these bugs in for weeks to months. They have energy requirements. They're not, uh, they're not just going to stay in there transmitting indefinitely. You don't know when, when you might have to how long you might need them for. So you need, the, you need to work out the, uh, the geometry of the room, you need to work out uh, where to place them, uh, how can they be refurbished. It takes a while. It's, it's an expert job and it's not plug and play. Okay, so when the, uh, uh, the police uh, technical operations guys bug drug dealers, it's pretty much pre-purchased gear. It's plug and play. Uh, but this is special. This is uh, done by the Secret Intelligence Service. Uh, ACES Tech Ops is, is different. So it was an enormous diversion of resources uh, to go in there to pretend to be uh, people who are refurbishing uh, the uh, uh, cabinet offices and then to actually have to do it. You actually have to really refurbish the cabinet offices. Um, that takes effort. And you can't just get somebody to do it. Uh, you know, they have to be trusted people. So that, once again, it's a you know, human resources or manpower intensive uh, act uh, to go and do this. So. Uh, um, the way, it were, the, way the, uh, the operation worked was um, the bugs were placed uh, inside uh, the walls uh, of the, um, of the uh, uh, cabinet offices and they, were, they would transmit a microwave signal of what was being said in the room. It would transmit via a line of sight transmission uh, to a floating hotel that was uh, moored on the wharf. Uh, about 75 to 80 percent of Timor, of Dili, the capital, had been burned down by the Indonesians. When they left, uh, people who don't remember it or don't know what it was about uh, will find it hard to, to understand. So let me explain. Yeah, drain pipes pulled up, copper wires pulled up, buildings destroyed, things burnt, uh, nothing's left standing. Um, and so when the international community, the aid commu community comes in uh, to refurbish the place uh, or rebuild, reconstruct, whatever, uh, uh, they need accommodation. And the accommodation is a, a hotel that's actually a ship with rooms in it, and it just, it's off, it, there's, a, there's a ramp, you get, get on the wharf, you walk up the ramp, you get on your ship, that's where you sleep for the night, and you can stay there for like six months, three months. Uh, so the uh, ACES team uh, took over uh, the front-facing rooms as a command post, which is where the listening element of the transmission uh, would uh, be beamed to, um, listen into all of that, and then couriered the, um, couriered the uh, uh, transcripts across, or the, the audio across to the Australian Embassy uh, in Delhi, across town, and from there straight uh, by a secure link uh, to Canberra uh, to work so that uh, the people back in, in DFAT uh, and ACES could work out exactly what needs to be offered to the Timorese in order to, uh, to make it happen. So this stuff, this stuff has, uh, uh, you know, despite uh, the authorities' best efforts, um, the precise tactics uh, uh, have become, uh, become known. Um, what isn't known, thankfully, 
um, and will not be known, um, is the identity of uh, uh, any of the people in there. Okay. Uh, one person who is going to be tried, I'm going to talk about in a second, is, um, he is called Witness K. So he is said to be the former, or at the time he was, the director of all technical operations for ACES. Okay, so he's not some low-level guy who you know, pretends to service your, uh, your uh, photocopy machine in order to steal the, um, the carbon uh, uh, cylinder, uh, which is what they usually do to, to work out what's been photocopied in it. Yeah, they get jobs working for Toshiba and places like that. Uh, I, these are indicative rather than Toshiba. These are just indicative. Uh, uh, you know, uh, so, but we're not talking about someone like that. We're talking about the head of all technical operations for ACES. That is somebody who knows where all the bugs are everywhere. Okay, for all operations. Uh, one of the most trusted people uh, in the Australian intelligence community. Um, he's said to have had grave misgivings about it. He couldn't work out why uh, this was going on. He began asking too many questions. Uh, and so he was told, we are having a new culture within ASUS. We need to have generational change. Uh, and so uh, uh, you're not going to have uh, uh, your position anymore. We have to make some restructuring inside ASUS. And so he was let go. Um, nothing much happened after he was let go. Okay? He didn't really do anything. Although he was, of course, dissatisfied. Uh, but then uh, one year later, uh, just after Timor finally did sign a treaty, after the bugging in September and October 2004, uh, soon after, early in the next year, um, the Secretary of the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, uh, Ashton Calvert, uh, resigned from the department, from the position as secretary, and joined the board of directors of Woodside Petroleum. Um, and um, um, that obviously led to even more consternation within ACES and elsewhere, but not within DFAT, where such arrangements are actually quite common. Um, and if you look at, I've, I've traced the careers of a few people in the book uh, using things like their last known position at, at uh, DFAT and then their LinkedIn profiles. And you see what appears to be a revolving door um, between um, uh, certain oil companies, uh, the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, uh, project management, and now corporate affairs for those same oil companies. So there's a revolving door. Um, it's less common with the ACES, apparently. So um, um, November 2007, uh, Kevin Rudd becomes prime minister, uh, and uh, Howard loses his seat. Uh, Alexander Downer is no longer foreign minister, and uh, so he's out of parliament. Uh, he retains a seat, but he doesn't want to be in Parliament anymore, so he leaves. And his first position that he takes up is a lucrative consultancy with Woodside Petroleum. And so that really uh, uh, got Witness K's uh, goat. Uh, and he began uh, a complaint process. So this is all, he's not a whistleblower in the sense that people think of a whistleblower. Okay. He is a guy who made a protected disclosure protected complaint to the Inspector General of Intelligence and Security. The Inspector General of Intelligence and Security is within the executive branch of government, so not, it's not genuine oversight, it's not legislative scrutiny, it's not judicial oversight, it's within the executive branch of government, but you're allowed to make a complaint to the Inspector General of Intelligence and Security. And uh, the IGES at the time told Witness K um, that you have certain options, and your options include uh, uh, taking private legal advice. Now, ACES is unlike most organizations, but in one respect, it is very much like other organizations. It has industrial disputes. Uh, people who want to get promoted can't get promoted. Uh, people who, uh, or, you know, it has another aspect to it as well. Sometimes people have post-traumatic stress disorder, and so uh, they need to see somebody. Well, you can't go and see a normal industrial relations lawyer, and you can't go and see a normal psychiatrist. And so there are a couple of people who are, who are nominated by ACES to be the designated uh, uh, listener for ACES officers or ASIO officers or other intelligence officers uh, with um, an industrial relations dispute. And one such person was Bernard Polary. Uh, Bernard Polary is the former uh, Attorney General of the Australian Capital Territory, a uh, successful um, barrister, uh, trial lawyer, um, and um, uh, he was the person that uh, ASIS uh, said could be the, the lawyer for any uh, industrial relations dispute. Um, Witness Gary is said to have gone to him and said that uh, he's been uh, uh, terminated as a result of uh, 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 a new culture within, within DFAT, uh, within, within ACES, 
And so Kaleri said, well, what is this uh, new culture? What do you mean? And he says, well, I was ordered to carry out an operation to bug the government of East Timor. And uh, that uh, made him pause, because Bernard Kaleri has some Anna as a background, which ACES is well aware of, I have to say. Uh, Bernard Kaleri, as the former Attorney General of the ACT, uh, is also a long-term uh, supporter of the rights of self-determination of the Timorese. Uh, he is um, a man who was born uh, when his, fa his father was dead when he was born, uh, because, but he was conceived, obviously, when his father was alive. His father was shot down uh, over the coast of the Netherlands in a, uh, in a uh, bow fighter, a uh, bomber, uh, during World War II. Uh, and he was brought up uh, by uh, uh, you know, his mother, and uh, uh, they come from a, a Catholic family. And uh, the case of Timor was well known to them. Um, and when Gareth Evans ordered that uh, crosses be removed from the, uh, the lawn outside the Indonesian embassy after the Delhi massacre, the Santa Cruz massacre of 12th November 1991, Bernard Collary, as the Attorney General of the ACT, began to take legal action to stop Gareth Evans. Um, and so he's known, it's not a secret, he's known as a supporter of the Timorese. Uh, what most people don't know is how close he actually is to the Timorese. Okay, but ACES knows, of course. Uh, and so Bernard happened to be in a position where uh, he uh, you know, had this conflict, uh, this, this moral conflict, what am I going to do? Uh, so he says, decided to stop speaking to Witness K and decided to conduct uh, his own legal analysis with external advice to work out you know, the legality of what actually has occurred. So here's where the, what the problem is. The, uh, the Intelligence Services Act 2001 defines uh, the role of ACES. Okay, so ACES can only be used for its proper role, and that is uh, for the defense, um, national security, uh, and economic well-being of Australia. Okay. And so at what point does the economic well-being of Australia morph into the economic well-being of a company and morph into the economic well-being of the Secretary of the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade uh, and the economic well-being of the, uh, the foreign minister uh, who is up to... Uh, 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 you know, all kinds of maneuvers. Uh, but then uh, there were other, other aspects as well as part of the legal advice that he got. Uh, here I'm simply saying what he says his legal advice was. I'm not making any legal claims of my own. Uh, and that is that there was a conspiracy to defraud uh, a joint venture partner. Okay? It's not like your, it's not as though economic well-being can never be used. It's not as though ACES can never be used for economic purposes. Uh, but then in certain cases, or when uh, Timor and Australia meet as joint venture partners uh, under the uh, terms of the Timor Sea Treaty, uh, it becomes uh, uh, a crime to, def to defraud your joint venture partner. Uh, it's actually covered in the ACT Criminal Code, which is where the operation was planned and ordered. So Section 334 of the Criminal Code of the, of the Australian Capital Territory uh, makes conspiracy to defraud uh, a crime, uh, but it's also a common law crime conspiracy. Um, and eventually uh, Bernard tried to, uh, uh, tried to uh, uh, set up a, a meeting between the Timorese side um, and the Australian side to see if some private matters could be, private arrangements could be made which would not embarrass the Australian government at all. Um, and it was completely rebuffed uh, based on information that has since uh, become public and I don't assert uh, the truth of it, I simply report it. Um, the then Prime Minister of Timor, Shana Guzmao, wrote a letter hand-delivered by the Foreign Minister of Timor to the Prime Minister, Julia Gillard, saying, we know this, we know what uh, your, your predecessors have done, we don't think you've done it, uh, and we want to reach an arrangement with you that protects our, our rights and your privacy. Uh, uh, he was immediately rebuffed, um, and uh, as a result of which, uh, Timor then began private arbitration uh, under, uh, at the Permanent Court of Arbitration in The Hague. It was all private, nobody knew about it. Uh, but uh, what actually happened after that was that the Australian government itself issued a press release saying that Timor has taken us to the private Permanent Court of Arbitration at The Hague for arbitration. They say that we've been uh, conducting espionage against them and uh, we, we neither confirm nor deny any intelligence allegations, but we've conducted ourselves in good faith at all times. Okay, so the cover was not blown by Witness K, the cover was not blown by, by Bernard Kaleri, the cover was not blown, uh, blown by Shinana Guzmao, it was blown by the Australian government itself in a press release. Um, 
uh, after that, uh, the next event was September 2013, uh, when the government changed, and uh, Senator George Brandis became Attorney General, and um, uh, Julie Bishop became Foreign Minister, um, and um, Bernard Colary's house was raided, uh, the house of uh, Witness K was raided, his passport was confiscated, he still hasn't gotten it back, uh, and George Brandis uh, warned from the floor of the Senate uh, that uh, prosecutions could uh, be launched. Um, now, five years, nothing happened for five years, and then, and then um, Timor and Australia finally signed uh, a treaty, uh, and the treaty uh, did recognize the median line, uh, but it provided for no compensation for past exploitation. So about uh, $5 billion worth of revenue has come out of uh, uh, certain oil fields called Labanera Coralina. Um, the total aid that Australia has given to Timor is about a billion. Uh, so this makes uh, East Timor Australia's largest donor. And I say in the book that this is not a typo. Okay, so East Timor is Australia's largest donor. Um, but the treaty provides for no compensation for past exploitation. Um, and soon after the treaty was signed, um, it was sent, of course, to the Senate Committee for Inquiry. Uh, it received, I'm not making this up, it received 45 minutes of consideration, uh, and then it was stamped. And then uh, uh, Bernard Galeri and Witness Co received uh, notifications that they're going to be charged okay, with uh, re releasing information about ACES. Uh, that's an offence under the Crimes Act and under the Intelligence Services Act, and the Crimes Act says how, how long you're going to get. So at the moment, uh, that thing would be 10 years in prison, but uh, because the alleged crime uh, is said to have occurred before the penalties were increased, um, it's a two-year sentence maximum. Okay. Uh, now, I just want to tie this up finally with that whole terrorism business where I started this talk. Um, as I said, in September 2004, there was this car bomb, um, and um, uh, the, uh, the then Attorney General, uh, Philip Ruddock, uh, introduced into the Senate, into, into the Parliament, uh, lower house, uh, the National Security Information Act. And the National Security Information Act said that once a, cert a certification has been, has been issued by the Attorney General, it'll have to be considered by the court and given special weight, not equal weight, special weight over the interests of public, of public trials. Uh, and if the court so decides, then the entire case is going to be heard in secret. And it's very interesting to see how Philip Ruddock introduced the National Security Information Act, uh, the bill, into Parliament. Uh, the third sentence of his speech quoted from the Director General of ASIO at the time, Dennis Richardson, saying there's a lot of terrorists, Islamic terror, and one of these days uh, we're going to need this provision uh, in order to protect uh, us from terrorists. Okay? And yet, and yes, that act has in fact been used in terror trials. Uh, there have been 46 uh, tri uh, people who've been tried, uh, almost all male, all Muslim. Um, uh, and now Witness K and Bernard Canary are now subject to the same National Security Information Act. So where are we at now? Based at least on the best information I have, um, um, the Commonwealth Director of Public Prosecutions has issued uh, a, a request to the Attorney General, Christian Porter, for him to issue uh, a, 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 a non-disclosure certificate under the National Security Information Act. Uh, if, or more, fee more plausibly, when uh, he issues that, uh, it'll be considered by the magistrate's uh, court in the ACT, uh, and the ACT magistrate's court under the Act cannot give equal weight uh, to the certificate and the need for public confidence in a fair and open trial. In an open trial, not fair, an open trial. They have to give special weight to the Attorney General's uh, certificate. Um, so it's expected that uh, sometime this month um, there will be uh, closed court hearings uh, to work out uh, how to enforce that uh, non-disclosure certificate. And there will also be um, um, uh, procedures for how the actual trial will be heard. Uh, now, it's possible to have a trial, for the, in a, a public trial, and also protect the interests of secrecy. Okay, so what's the key secrecy that needs to be protected in terms of disclosure? Um, it's the identity of Witness K, okay, because Witness K is a former spy. 
uh, he has not only been head of all technical operations, but he has actually been a spy, which is which means probably an undercover or non a non official cover person who has say been under uh, operating under a fictitious uh, profession identity and so on. Um, and so, if a foreign government or governments were to find out witness gay's identity, they would know who in their countries uh, he was particularly close to or had regular meetings with. And they would then be able to work out, well, who are our traitors, uh, and then knock him off. And that would reduce ACES's credibility uh, indefinitely. Okay? So you'd want to hide witness gay, witness gay's identity. But beyond that, there is no national security information that needs to be, except for one very important thing that to launch the case, the Australian government's going to have to admit that it did in fact bug Timo. Because otherwise, there's no way for it to actually convict uh, Kuleri and Kay. It has to admit, yes, we bugged Timo, and they disclose that. Okay. So uh, that's the other national security information that has to be protected. But in this case, it's hard to see how there's a public benefit to protect that information. So how would witness Kay's identity be protected if uh, the court would or so decide. Uh, one way is simply, um, um, well, there's been a, a very important uh, uh, coronal inquest into the into an aircraft crash involving the deaths of some special forces operators in the United Kingdom, and uh, there was an Australian airman called Paul Pardol who was uh, who died in that uh, in that in that crash. As it happened, Bernard Colary was one of the lawyers in that uh, coronal inquest in the United Kingdom. And so all the special forces operate, uh, operatives, they testified from behind the screen and their identities were protected. So it would be very simple in the ACT Magistrates Court for witness K to enter through a different entrance and testify from behind the screen. Uh, but it remains to be seen if that is in fact what uh, um, the, the Chief Magistrate of the ACT, Lorraine Walker, actually does. Okay, so where we're at now is um, sometime this month, uh, there'll be a preliminary hearing, which will go on for a while, to work out how the trial will happen then there will be a trial, uh, which will, well, could be held completely in secret, uh, followed by a conviction. Okay. Is there any possibility of pursuing the individuals who were actually involved, as in uh, the foreign minister authorizations? Would that proceed if there is ever? You'd need the, uh, you'd need the, uh, 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 the consent of the Attorney General for a prosecution like that. And uh, the current Shadow Attorney General, Mark Dreyfus, uh, is making an ostrich look curious. You see, he's actually, he's actually playing it very cool. He's actually not saying anything. You see, Mark Dreyfus, the Shadow Attorney General, is not saying anything. Uh, he's, not, he's giving complete uh, moral support through his silence uh, to the to his counterpart, Attorney General Christian Porter. Mm -hmm. Not a word of criticism, uh, not a word of, uh, of even doubt or, or skepticism on the parliamentary privilege to say, well, what exactly is going on? I demand a private briefing, uh, nothing. Um, and so uh, uh, I have no real hope in, in that. Um, and just a quick follow-up question. If uh, uh, Kay was found guilty, where would they possibly imprison him? Well, I mean, it's a oh. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, 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 that's fine. The, the, the state is very powerful and can work it out. Um, there are any number of prisons in Broome and uh, Darwin, Alice Springs. Uh, no, no, no shortage of prisons in Australia. Anyone? Yeah. A few things, but start with this one. Um, I'm still unclear. I, well, put it another way. It seemed at the time that this was, that, that, that proceedings were going to occur. It seemed to a few of us, the question arose, why? You know, why tactically did the government do it? Was it, what were they going to gain from? The espionage or the, or the, or the prosecution? Sorry? The espionage or the prosecution? No, the prosecution. Oh, yeah. okay, so I can ask that, sure. Just give us your... Sure. Your, uh, you know, enclosed views to why they take Oh, well, it's a warning to anybody else in ACES who might have uh, uh, doubts about uh, or, or, or dissent uh, about, uh, um, you know, the uh, uh, operations that are ordered uh, for the benefit of private uh, corporate interests. Really 
well, I mean, look. Not yeah, like typical from any other intelligence. No, I, I just want, this is an important question, and I think I should, I should add a few things which you have, just to put it in context. You really need to, to understand this, um, uh, how the thing works, because you don't see it from their perspective, okay? You're seeing it from your perspective. And that is your perspective is, well, uh, isn't it so much of a hassle? What about the negative publicity, et cetera, et cetera? Uh, and that's not the way uh, policy works. Uh, I've had a look at this like for many years about how policy works, and you can look at it. I'll just put a few facts before you. Um, the invasion of Iraq has resulted in, uh, an, in a huge amount of terrorism, uh, destruction of states, uh, migrant uh, slash refugee crisis, um, and uh, policy continues with no threat to it. Uh, the government of Saudi Arabia uh, uh, wound up uh, knocking off uh, a journalist in its consulate in Turkey, um, and there are sanctions on Venezuela. Um, power systems do not flinch uh, from uh, taking hard action. Uh, they're not worried about negative publicity. Um, that's not the way policy works. Um, the a recipient of the Companion to the Order of Australia is uh, Richard Wolcott of Timor fame, John Howard, etc., uh, etc. Et um, and uh, power systems are not worried about the things you're worried about. Uh, you're about, well, isn't it so much of a difficulty? Isn't it, uh, what about the negative publicity? Isn't that going to harm them? No, it doesn't. Okay, uh, they have gotten away with uh, far, far worse. Uh, and public opinion doesn't change anything. Public action, yeah, okay, that's a different thing. But uh, opinion, no. Uh, the pu public will. I, I'm, I'm. Refute me. Mm -hmm. I don't want to refute you. I'll just. Uh, uh, just uh, sure. Uh, I'll come back to it. Sure. Well, Go ahead. Just, just uh, further. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just further to that. At the time they were charged, um, I think it was Andrew Wilkie who rather obliquely suggested that the charges were laid not to actually have revenge on them, but that was in fact an attempt to preempt somebody else yes. revealing something in contemporary. Yes, there was um, a speech he gave on the 20th of June uh, mm -hmm. last year. So, uh, which, where he said all that, and in fact he's the guy who revealed because the, the fact of the charges was itself protected um, in the letters. Uh, like Witness K was not allowed to retain his letter. It was delivered to him by uh, an armed escort. He was shown it, his charge, and it was taken away. Uh, Bernard Colary was allowed to see his letter, but uh, certain things were not uh, in the letter, um, and it was all under privilege. And so uh, Andrew Wilkie somehow found out and then uh, said it under parliamentary privilege, which is why we know about this. And he, he has indicated um, that he will use parliamentary privilege from time to time to ventilate uh, other matters. Uh, but yes, it is, a, uh, it is a warning to anybody else who has uh, doubts uh, about ASIS about um, uh, intelligence operations. Yeah, Helen. I'm wondering uh, what you think, when you think the fact that George Brandis sat on the information for five years and yet Christian Porter almost immediately launched the charges, what's the significance of that? Do you think it's because of their slightly different political positionings within the Liberal Party or do you think it's... No, no, nothing uh, like that. It's a party, it's a policy that would have been solidly supported. No, 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 look, it's nothing like that. It's, uh, it's not. well, 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 Brandis um, uh, uh, announced that, uh, he made, a, made an announcement in, uh, I think, in December 2017, only after he'd been uh, named, like within hours of being named as our ambassador or high commissioner uh, to the UK. Um, but why it was done, according to Wilkie in his um, parliamentary speech, oh. that it was done, they waited until they got the treaty with Timor. Mm -hmm. uh, and and his, his line was, uh, and I'm quoting now, uh, with the diplomacy out of the way, it's time to bury the bodies. I, th I think that's what he said uh, in, in Parliament. With the diplomacy out of the way, it's time to bury the bodies. Something like that. Yeah, so it's, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Is there any uh, defense under the legislation that they've been charged for? Uh, I've never met Witness K, okay, and so I'm not. I'm not like a, speaking as an insider who, you know, confers there and then kind of comes outside and tells people what's going on. So, so I don't know what strategies there his legal team is going to be. And I've never met Kaleri's lawyers. Like I, I know Bernard, but I've never discussed it with his lawyers. And why would they talk to me, right? Um, and I'm not saying this. Like, you know, fingers crossed. I actually have never met his lawyers. I don't know Witness K. Uh, well, there is what's called the International Organizations Privileges and Immunities Act. Uh, now, this is an act of uh, federal parliament. 
uh, which confers immunity in certain cases. Uh, so you look at the International Organization's Privileges and Immunities Act, look at Section 9 of that Act. Um, that says that if you are a, an advocate, judge, or witness before a proceedings involved in the International Court of Justice, then in certain circumstances, you can be immune from prosecution. Now, that would require the government of Timor-Leste to assert its privilege and immunity and say, well, Colary acted for us and Witness K was his witness and therefore it's a thing. I don't know. I would suspect uh, that the government of Timor is about as amoral as the government of Australia. Uh, and we'll be quite happy to throw these guys under a, under the bus, under a bus. And uh, uh, look, I, I have, I'm not particularly enamoured of states. I just don't think that they have any great moral sort of component to them. Um, just look at uh, the fact that they spend about, uh, what is it, uh, for years they spent like less than 10% of their budget on health and education combined. Uh, and a huge amount of their budget on big contracts for quite wealthy people. Do you have you I'm talking about East Timor, right, right. Um, I, I, I have, they, they respond to powerful domestic sectors, just like us. Um, and so uh, it would require them to turn up in the ACT Magistrates Court, along with the defense team, and say, we're asserting immunity, and these guys uh, are covered by it. Uh, they do, they do. Uh, that's, that's a defense, just to answer you. That's one defense. One of the others, uh, perhaps to argue that the uh, operation itself uh, was, uh, was somehow outside the purposes of the Intelligence Services Act. Uh, but I, 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 I would say that they would still have, uh, under the Act, the ability to complain only to the Inspector General of Intelligence and Security, okay, not to somebody else. And that's very different to Australia, uh, to, to the United States. So for example, uh, in the US, uh, this is as a result of the uh, uh, you know, Nixon's secret uh, bombing of Cambodia. And it was secret. It was secret not to the Cambodians, no. but, but it was secret to the, to the, to the US Congress. Okay? And so uh, uh, part of the reforms after that and the various uh, committees, the church committee and so on about assassinations, was that all intelligence operations uh, have fit into certain categories. And depending on the category, they have to be disclosed to certain other people than the executive branch, right? So uh, the, what they call the Gang of Four, who is the uh, Republican and uh, Democrat leaders in the Senate, Republican and Democrat leaders in Congress are briefed on intelligence operations. And the Gang of Eight, which is the four I've mentioned, plus the deputies, uh, are also shown it. And in fact, their, their um, advisors, their staffers, are, are actually couriered across the Potomac River to uh, CIA headquarters and they are shown footage of drone strikes as they occur, uh, just after they occur, right? So while there's a covert drone war going on and people are being killed and, you know, weddings and so on are being uh, mistaken for, uh, for military aged males and carnage is being caused in Yemen and Afghanistan, it's not occurring entirely within the executive branch, okay? Congress or the legislative arm of government is involved. They see all the intelligence, they see all the operations. Now, the big difference between that and Australia is that under our conventions, an incoming government is not briefed about intelligence operations ordered by its predecessor. Okay. So nobody would have known about the Timor operation, certainly not the new foreign minister, Stephen Smith, who was foreign minister under Rudd, certainly not Rudd himself, who was foreign minister under Gillard, and certainly not Bob Carr, who was foreign minister under Gillard as well. Right, uh, and so um, they were never they were never told. Whereas that's not the case in, in other countries, like in the United States, uh, an incoming government is not briefed about past operations ordered by its predecessor. If the prime minister himself, let's say Mr. Shorten, were to, were to go to the head of ACES and say, "I want to see that," the convention is still no. It can only be revealed with the consent, the written consent, the the, the old prime minister. Okay, so there's a huge uh, rule of law problem uh, in our system. There's a major sort of hiatus in governance uh, of our intelligence agencies. Uh, I hope that is okay. It may be a, uh, an interview he gave with uh, Leo Shanahan, a journalist for the Australian newspaper, 
Uh, it may be interviews he gave with Emma Alberici on Late Line. Uh, it, you know, it may be interviews he gave with, uh, with somebody else. But the charge sheet doesn't actually mention Leo Shanahan, although Leo Shanahan from the Oz is the first person to, in fact, disclose this. Um, and uh, Senator Nick McKim of Tasmania said in Parliament, under privilege once again, um, that, you know, is the, uh, uh, is, is the Commonwealth Director of Public Prosecutions uh, trying to uh, protect, um, you know, um, people in the media who are perceived to be closer or more sympathetic to it. Um, so I don't know exactly what it is, but if the information that he's, that if they're being charged with disclosing the fact of an ACES operation, um, then they would have to admit that there was an operation, that the information is true. Yeah. I'll just quickly jump in on that. I was just thinking before, isn't it kind of, assuming that, and correct me if I'm wrong, that the Australian state's goal here is to punish people in a sense for doing this kind of thing or to create a threat of, you know, what you might, you know, to deter future actions, don't they have to reveal that, you know, they spied, these people did this? In a sense, you know, isn't it? Otherwise, you were saying before, like, because you were saying before, yes. it doesn't matter. That well, they, well once them. again, it may be, as Lizzie said, that, you know, that's not entirely clear, but we don't know what the actual information is, because that's all secret. It may be that simply saying that Witness K is the former director of all technical operations for ACES. That's information about ACES. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's Section 39 of the Intelligence Services Act. That's the Section 39 offense. It, that may be it. Uh, it may not even be that, uh, the, the, uh, the debugging operation. And then why may they even go through? What, what, what's the motive? To, the to punish yeah, yeah. those guys. Anyone who does anything. Right. Anyone who right. does anything. Right. Yeah, okay. Yes, David. Yeah. David Husky. Add to that, but it also uh, is part of the strategy so they can keep doing things like this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. They have no intention of doing something like this. They have no intention of stopping the other down and going and working for whoever we went to work no. for the head of DFAT. No. I mean, there are, there are other things that come. There are other things that come up. You know, for example, what if somebody from uh, who works in the Joint Defence Facilities uh, near Alice Springs, I'm referring to Pine Gap, uh, uh, has a crisis of conscience and says, "Look, we're killing all these innocent people. Uh, we're killing a whole bunch of guilty people. We're killing a terrorist. We're also killing some innocent people. Uh, I, I, can't, I can't live with myself anymore. I'm going to talk to somebody." Uh, well, uh, I, the government definitely doesn't want that happening. Uh, so there, there's all kinds of uh, of reasons to. You know, if, you, if you're thinking at it from the perspective of the, of the state, you know, they can actually say, I'm going to charge you 35% of your salary, give it to me. You know, I mean, that's tax, right? But it's law. <laughs> they have power. Uh, they're they not worried about public relations and opinion and things like that. But aren't they, isn't that, aren't they worried about opinion if, uh, like what you were saying, that they don't want people revealing stuff like that? Yeah, yes. Aren't they worried about public opinion? Isn't, isn't the reason they don't about worry? disclosure of certain operations. Or is it more about international relations? Well, they're not worried about public opinion in the sense of uh, prosecuting Kaleri and Kay. Uh, but they would definitely be worried about public opinion about certain operations that they're doing. I mean, the, the whole Timor thing is a great example. Sorry, go ahead. I'm interested in this, this, you know, you said people like us don't think the same way as them. I'd like you to explain more about that because it's vital for us to know that... Well, you aren't immortal. You aren't, yeah. And the state is. But what, they, what they did to Timor seems to be like a... Act of hostility. It's criminal right. hostility to Timor. Right. Um, that's that's one thing. But also, you, you explained about how they sold all that geoscience data. They gave it. So cheaply. Yeah. You said a small percent. Yeah. Five percent. So why did they bug the Timor embassy? And what were they getting from Woodside or from the deal with oil companies? Why why would they be acting on the behalf of this commercial company? They wanted to make the company rich. Because it makes them rich. No, no. no, no, no they just that, that this this. Look, um, I I'm, I'm, let, let me just think about how to actually say it. I know the answer, but I'm trying to work out how to to pitch it. Like you want to think, uh, see see things from their perspective, right? Um, the uh, sure. Uh, Woodside shares are going up. They they came from they were a little known company in November 1984. Uh, they are now in the uh, top ten, top 20 companies by market capitalization in the stock exchange. Um, they've gotten quite wealthy. The shareholders who own them have gotten wealthy as well. It's been a success of policy, and policy is working the way it should have. Now, how, how do I actually understand this? Why do they do it? Well, look, the most important decisions uh, aren't who to vote for in any kind of economy or country. It's what's to be produced, how is it to be produced, uh, and 
who's going to share in it. That, that, that's the most important, those are the most important decisions that are actually made. Now, those decisions are not, in, are not in, in, in under democratic control. Those decisions are under private hand, private control. Um, and so, people who go to government, uh, the ambitious backbenchers who want to become prime ministers, uh, they have to go and audition uh, before those uh, groups that control uh, the commanding heights. Um, and so, they, the orientation is, well, what can we do to please you? Uh, that, that is, I'm just describing standard policy. Um, Clinton, you describe it wonderfully on page well, three. Just as an absolutely amazing paragraph in there. Uh, uh, no, 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 it's a bit too long. No, no, good. But, but it's, 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 it's really wonderful. The book's fantastic, but that, this paragraph encapsulates for me what I'm trying to work on for the last few months about the nature of the, the state and its links to corporate power and so on. Well, in the first case, I think it's just a matter of, of understanding um, understanding um, uh, business, really. I like my favorite newspaper is the Financial Times and the Fin Review. Uh, you know, apart from the National Archives, those are the most frequently cited kind of things, and it's in the back of my head. Um, how? I mean, look, the only the only place that this case is being reported in the private media. I mean, I'm not talking about Crikey, which is different. That's a special case. Is the Fin Review? It's only people like Lisa Murray and so on who are actually reporting it. Fairfax is not. Uh, forget about commercial, I don't know, commercial radio, TV. I haven't had a TV in 20 years, so I don't know. But, you know, um, because those are the most important papers. Uh, they, they report it. Uh, I mean, look, if you ask the average activist about, um, and here I don't know, okay, I'm here I'm completely speculating, so, um, well, name the top 20 companies in our stock exchange. How many companies are there? Uh, how much are they worth? Uh, how many, you know, who's actually running them? Um, fewer people who are political activists would know that. Uh, they would know more about uh, politics uh, in terms of what's going on in parliament and things like that. So one of the things I've tried to do in the book is show that um, of the top 20 companies in the stock exchange, um, we've got, a, they're run by 190 directors, that's it, okay? And 16 of them live in one suburb of Sydney, Mossman. Uh, four of them live in the whole state of Queensland, which means Mossman has four times more directors on the top 20 companies than the whole state of Queensland. Um, the, the nature of our economy, the economic literacy, I think, of the activist community uh, would have to be uh, raised. Um, and to see the world from the perspective of those that actually own it. Um, and that's how you try to understand how the thing works. So that's really what I try to do in the book, try to see the world from the perspective of those who own it. Um, and you can understand the stock exchange um, and, and how the system works. There's about 2,400 companies at any given time. Um, 200 of them uh, make up 80% of all the money in the stock exchange, uh, and 20 of them make up 50% of all the money in the stock exchange. Okay, um, and of those 20, they got 190 directors, and most of the uh, 60 of them live in one suburb of Sydney, uh, and a very narrow group. Um, and what they do is not visible. It's not see. It's not a conspiracy. I mean, they're just there to make profit share and money. And so if, if, if you want to be a politician, one of the things you do is you ask them uh, for their views and you pay a special weight to them. That's the way the state works. Uh, and it's not just the undersea riches, okay? The most, uh, uh, each year, or each, every, every few years, the United States Geological Survey, which is their version of Geoscience Australia, uh, puts out a study of uh, critical commodities. Okay, so where are the critical commodities needed? And there's one important study called Critical Commodities for a High-Tech World. The most important com commodities needed uh, for a world of uh, smartphones, uh, electric vehicles, and so on. And they do, they do a survey of where these commodities actually are. Now, it turns out that Australia has quite a few of them. We're very rich in them. But Maybe one exception, uh, cobalt, 85% uh, is in Cong Democratic Republic of Congo. We've got 10% and there's a few here and there. Okay, um, most of us don't know that. Okay, and so what we'll be trying to do, the government will, will simply create the conditions for profitability uh, in order to uh, make sure that uh, certain companies uh, get access to that. Uh, they will 
and, will, and, and the government will go and send Geoscience Australia, which actually has its own maps. Geoscience Australia has its own maps. It's on the website that says that's where the tantalum is. That's where molybdenum is. That's where coltan is. That's where cobalt is. The companies take those maps, and it's not just saying, oh, well, you know, it's in sort of, you know, Warrandyte or whatever. It's right there in that rock, and it looks there, and it's at this depth. The companies then go in, dig it up, it's theirs. You talk about the revolving door. Yeah. All right, now, as you're aware, I do research in the military, and mm -hmm. you're no doubt aware the military has the same revolving door process mm. where we have people like Tim Beasley before he became governor being on the board of Lockheed Martin, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. If you, you couple the revolving, and yeah, it's both parties, Chris Pine, after the next election, may join the board of British Aerospace, who knows? Mm -hmm. But, um, when you look at the government's, this, this current government's changing of the intelligence, um, the intelligence community's way they interact with each other through a few different methods they've done over the last few years, and, and all the, the cyber security metadata. But when you also, when you talk about ACES having the, the change of climate, generational change to people, and, and maybe I misread the subtext, but I got the subtext from you that to a new generation of people who won't have quarantine Correct. without bugging offices for commercial prospects. Correct. Can we assume that, you know, you know, with Australia, for example, push for the Defence Export Facilitation Grant to be the top 20 arm for all the mm -hmm. reasons we both know, that this is now, if not common practice, not uncommon practice? Yeah, it's a new, it's a, it's a new world. Uh, absolutely. Like when we go over to Indonesia for Indon 2018 and all that. Yeah. Commercial, commercial espionage is the, the new direction uh, for I mean, it's always been a part of it. Yes. But uh, yeah, this is, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's very acute now. So beyond Timor, oh, yeah. and as atrocious as all that was, mm -hmm. I don't want to take away from the subject yeah. at hand, we can assume that this is what our intelligence services are doing all around the world. Hang on, you mean overseas? I'm not talking about domestically. I'm right? talking yeah. overseas. Yeah. You, meant, yeah. you, you mentioned um, Cobalt sure. in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Congo right, right. Poor fucking Congolese. Yeah. I mean, they had enough over the years. Yeah. But Australian mm -hmm. mining companies are currently involved in Congo. There are more Australian yeah. mining companies on the continent of Africa than based in any other first world nation. Uh, they, they, yes. Uh, I, I, I assume that ISIS right. has got its hand in that. Yes. Uh, and I just want to say that uh, companies that are on our stock exchange that have headquarters in Australia that are listed as Australian companies are not majority owned by Australians. Okay. So, for example, BHP is 68% American owned. But if you look at the beneficial ownership, and once again, it takes a lot of effort to get this data. It's actually only a matter of plugging into a computer screen and doing it, right? But it costs $2,000 um, uh, a month uh, or $50,000 for two years to get a Bloomberg, a Bloomberg professional subscription. That Bloomberg professional subscription is available to uh, people who are you know, at Comsec and the big stock brokerage houses. But most of us simply haven't got the resources uh, to go and get ourselves a $50,000 for two years Bloomberg subscription uh, to type in BHP. You know, where are the beneficial owners? Well, they're 68% uh, uh, American. Uh, Rio Tinto, 83% uh, or foreign owned. Uh, Origin, almost 100%. Okay. Revolving door, like it's okay for Witness K and Bernard Collery to end up in the shit. Yeah. But the, the deep. The there you go. Thanks so much. No worries. Nice to meet you. Hi. Hi. Yep. I would like to just spoken at different things. There you go. Sorry. Well done. Thank you.